We have, from evolution, just a basic hedonic system that says for the individual, what's good, what's pleasurable, what's advantageous, right? And But as soon as you start to live with others and depend upon them, then you need a second signal that, that takes into account how your action might increase the, the way they value you or how it might decrease the way they value you. I am glad to share this time with the pioneers of the evolutionary psychology studies, Lida Kasmides and John Tooby. John, can you tell us uh, about how evolutionary psychology may help us to understand our emotions like envy, guilt, shame, or pride? In which way evolutionary psychology brings us uh, information regarding this these emotions? So uh, the basic question one always asks is you start with the recognition that, you know, initially all life on earth was as single celled and that everything that we are now that's part of our species design uh, had to be added sort of step by step. And so you ask the question, why is it there? What function does it serve for the organism? Otherwise it wouldn't be there, right? So in some ways this is a little bit monstrous to sort of say, what would people be like without, say, shame, mm -hmm. okay? Um, but you have to, that one appreciates the question as, what would a human be like without shame, for example, mm -hmm. and what would be a person with shame? And there you get a sense of what it might be doing uh, that was helpful for our ancestors in survival and reproduction. For our ancestors, they lived in small groups of people that were highly dependent on each other. So if you got sick, somebody had to bring you food. Uh, if you, uh, you know, uh, somebody had to help you with your children. And uh, if there was, you know, a predator or something, uh, somebody saved you, it would be very important. So it was, your life was highly dependent upon the being valued by other people. And therefore, if you're just, if your psychology is just to take what's of advantage to you, do what's advantageous to you, then that often hurt, that could hurt other people, right? Because what might be in my interest might not be in another person's interest, right? Well, I would have the money and money is good, right? Uh, but on the other hand, the people around me might value me less, right? And so then I have to say, ah, in almost all behavior, there's a sort of implicit planning process that sort of says, what shouldn't I do because the, it will cause other people to value me less. And so that's experienced negatively as it mm -hmm. ought to be. I mm -hmm. have to be deterred from doing that. So I would feel shame, you know, I, I think about doing this and then, ah, oh no, that would be shameful. And so even when you're not, have, haven't done something shameful, you're just making your decisions in life. There's behind that there's shame or the opposite is pride, right? How can I become more valuable, valuable people? And so I might do things that might be costly I might sort of run a bigger risk in battle, or I might do other things. I mean, take food I might want to eat and give it to somebody else. And uh, and that I feel pride, right? And that's a positive pleasure that, mm -hmm. that subtracts against the loss of the advantage. And so these emotions, you add them into what the organism would otherwise be doing, and you see how it navigates us through the world in a way that is makes you better off. The, the uh, evolutionary psychology uh, is support in very strong research. And uh, one of your research is regards uh, about economy and behavioral economics. Yes. Can you share uh, with us, Lida, about your findings? Adam Smith asked, um, he wondered whether uh, the propensity to, how did he say it, to truck barter and exchange, mm -hmm. whether that was uh, part of human nature or whether that was just arose from a sort of general kind of reasoning and the ability to speak. And the answer is human nature. Um, we've done a lot of research over the years on different kinds of cooperation, but on social exchange, um, reciprocating favors, um, how you think about agreements to exchange. And it turns out that there's uh, a set of mechanisms. You can think of it as a, a reasoning instinct. People think about 
instinct is the opposite of reasoning, but we have certain inference mechanisms that are complexly specialized for solving a, an adaptive problem. They reliably develop in all human beings they, without conscious effort, without formal instruction. They're distinct from more general abilities to process information or uh, think about other things. And we, our mechanisms for thinking about exchange are like that. Um, in particular, evolutionary game theory shows mm -hmm. that you can't get the evolution of cooperation of this kind unless you're able to detect cheaters. That is, people who take benefits from you without um, reciprocating, without paying the cost or meeting the requirement that you had for mm -hmm. that favor. Mm -hmm. um, and so that made us look for, do we ask the question, do we have mechanisms in our heads that are specialized for looking for cheaters? And the answer is yes. You can take a reasoning problem and uh, take, you can take the same reasoning problem and have it be about social exchange where looking for the violation of a, of a rule would reveal a cheater versus uh, a rule about some other domain of life. Like mm -hmm. if a bird is a swan, then it's white. People are not good at looking for violations of that rule. They're not look at, good at looking for black swans. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but if you make the mm -hmm. rule uh, be something like, well, if you borrow my car, then you should fill the tank with the gas. Mm -hmm. People are really good at realizing that the people that they have to check are the person that, that borrowed the car and the person who did not fill the tank with gas. And, you know, on a rule like the swan kind of rule, maybe only 26% of the people will get that right, mm -hmm. whereas 75% of the people will get it right when it's looking for cheaters. So that's thing one. We seem to have mechanisms that really are um, designed for understanding, exchange, and understanding, and looking for cheaters. But that's not, but hunter gatherers had to share in many different ways, not just through reciprocation. So in studies of Aceh foragers in Paraguay, um, about uh, about fifty percent of the time, people come back with nothing when they go hunting. So what hunter gatherers do is, when there's frequent reversals of fortune that are just due to luck, not effort, um, they share very widely. They they pull the risk. It's an insurance. It's a form of in, of social insurance. So since I can't store meat in a refrigerator for my family mm -hmm. to eat later, I store it as a social obligation. So hunter-gatherers will, when they, for things like meat, they'll share it very widely with people. And that's more like when Marx talks about from each according to his ability to each according to his need, he thought that's how hunter-gatherers share in general. No. Hunter-gatherers do share like that, but it's for meat, honey, things that are where luck plays a big role. For things where effort plays a big role, like when you're gathering foods, um, when you're gathering plant foods and things like that, it's not shared in the same way. People tend to have particular recipro reciprocation mm -hmm. partners or they do explicit exchange. Mm -hmm. So it's not, an, it's not mm -hmm. true that hunter-gatherers share everything as Marx th thought. Um, but we do have programs in our heads that change, that switch what we think is fair when outcomes are due to luck versus effort. This is true not just for hunter-gatherers. You don't have to be raised as a hunter-gatherer for this to be true. You can take people, undergraduates from Japan or the United States, and if you give them money as a windfall, so just luck, and say you can divide that or not with somebody else as you mm -hmm. wish, they do share that. But if they have to do something, especially something boring, in order to earn the money, then they, they, they don't share it. So it's, it's, it's as if our, our, our brain has different programs that are activated by different circumstances. The luck act activates this, oh, I should share widely. The effort is, I should do this through reciprocation. And then we have still other programs that are for collective action, for cooperating in to achieve a common goal and then share the resulting benefits. But that evolved for a very small social world. Hunter-gatherers tend to live in bands of 50 to 200 uh, mm -hmm. men, women, and children mm -hmm. all together. So in that social world, if you're doing something uh, as a group, you know, you're hunting, collectively hunting or something like that, you know all the people and you know if they're free riding or not. You know if they're supposed to be coming and helping you and they're yeah. back at the camp yeah. taking a nap. Yeah. Um, and so you're able to monitor who's contributing and who's not contributing. When you try to, to scale that up, 
as the Soviet Union did, for example, that it collapses because you're scaling it up to large numbers of people on a collectivized farm. Um, and what, pe- what happens is with no, without punishment, this, and this has been shown in many economic games in, in laboratories too, without punishment, people, when they see free writing, they withdraw their own contributions until it dwindles to nothing. But the notion uh, uh, that, that Adam Smith was, what, what Adam Smith was saying is that through this system of people ex- exchanging, that they can be doing it for their private gain, but it makes everybody better off. That's not intuitive. That's not intuitive to the human mind. To engage in exchange is intuitive. And to share uh, widely when there's difference to do the luck, those things are intuitive. But the idea that this, um, this micro level process of exchange can actually improve life for everybody, that, the problem is that, that that's not intuitive. All psychologists were trying to understand what are the information processing programs in the mind, what, what kind of software do we have, what kind of programs are in our heads, but it's, we approach it with the recognition that these programs evolved to solve problems of survival and reproduction that were faced by our ancestors, our hunter-gatherer ancestors during evolutionary history. <laughs>